God is so awesome. So let's get into the Word of God, and I want to establish something, and I know this sometimes is repetitive, but it's important. Everybody say, it's important. You've got to understand how the Bible works. You've got to understand that there is an Old Testament and a New Testament. And you've got to understand that there's an Old Covenant and a New Covenant. You've got to... Oh, it's up on the screen. You've got to understand that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was never New Testament. So that's incorrect. That was a, a crazy homosexual guy by the name of King James. Don't follow King James. He was crazy. And he was a homosexual. And he had atheists translate the Bible. Turn to your neighbor and say, that ain't right. That's why the Bible says, study to show yourself approved. So if you don't study, I guess you don't get approved. Hmm. So what, what do we find out? In the Old Testament, it was written to human beings. Everybody say human beings. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're not one. Uh-uh, you're a spirit being. You've got to know the difference between a human being and a spirit being. Human beings could do nothing. That's why you see the black dot uh, right there on that line over on the left-hand side. And it was under the law. Everybody say, the law. They had to follow the law. They couldn't do anything. They had no power. They had no grace. So they had to ask God for everything. Did you notice from that dot the arrow is pointing forward? Why is the arrow pointing forward? Whatever they prayed for was a future event. Don't forget that. Whatever they prayed for in the Old Testament was what? An event. And whatever we're praying for is a past event. You need to understand that. When they asked for healing, God sent His Word and healed them. But it was a future event. When we ask God to heal us, God says, No, 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 don't ask me to heal you. Look back. What am I looking at? The cross. Don't ask me to save you. Look back. What am I looking at? The cross. Don't ask me to bless you or prosper you. Look back. Why? Because Jesus said three words on the cross. What were they? It is finished. For us, everything was finished at the cross. For them, they were waiting for God to do everything. We don't have to wait for God to do anything because we're not under the law. We're under grace. And what happened when God, Jesus went to the cross? 2 Corinthians 5.17. This is an incredible verse, and it changed my life when I understood exactly what it meant. 2 Corinthians 5.17. We'll put that up on the screen. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any person is engrafted in Christ, uh -huh, aha, that, that's you and me. What's happened? He is a new creation. He is a what? New. new creation. And the Greek word that was used there is a species that never before existed. That's why you cannot have a past. You cannot have generation. Well, you don't know what my grandfather did. Uh, I've got nothing to do with you. I came from a prominent Muslim family. It doesn't matter what my father did. It doesn't matter what my grandfather did or my great-great-great-grandfather. It makes no difference. I've become a species that never before existed. It doesn't matter if you had Buddhist relatives. That's got nothing to do with you. You've become a species that never before existed. What does that mean? You have no past. That's why it says old things have what? Passed away. All. What does all mean? All things have become new. So everything is new now. And not only that, when that occurred, go back to the, uh, we'll go over to uh, Ephesians 1, 7, 1, 18. The foundational scriptures. I wish every believer had this revelation. And we wouldn't be praying for nobody. They'd be praying for themselves. Hmm. By having the eyes of our heart flooded with light. That's the Word of God. So you can know and understand. What are you supposed to know? What are you supposed to understand? The hope. What is the hope? The image that God has of you. What image does God have of you? Let's see how God sees you. The hope uh, of uh, he, what He's called you. How rich is His glorious inheritance in the saints. So what happened is when you gave your life to Christ, you got an inheritance. What is this inheritance? And who gave it to you? Jesus. Somebody has to die to get an inheritance. And it was Jesus that went to the cross. What was this inheritance? Next verse. The Bible says, Aha, uh -huh, you can know and understand what is the immeasurable. Everybody say immeasurable. immeasurable. Everybody say unlimited. unlimited. What does the word immeasurable mean? Can't measure it. What does the word unlimited mean? No limits. No limits to what? Surpassing greatness of His power. Everybody say God's power. 
The next word after the word power is what? In. Where? In God? No, it doesn't say that. In you. Now this is, this is, I mean the mind is tough to get around this. But isn't that what the Bible says? The power is in you who believe. Everybody shout, I'm a believer. So we ought to believe, right? What's in you? Power. What didn't they have in the Old Testament? Power. They were human beings. When you gave your life to Christ, Jesus came to live in your spirit. But it was a package deal. Your spirit came alive. Guess what? Now you got in you the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, the glory of God, the grace of God, the anointing of God, the power of God, and even the kingdom of God. Everybody shout, I'm loaded. See, you have much more. That's why you don't have to beg God to do anything. You already have the authority and the power to do that. Well, I don't know about the authority. You got, everybody say, I got the power, I got the power. when I got spirit-filled. Spirit Isn't that what Acts 1.8 says? When you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you will have what? Power. Okay, what about the authority? When did I get the authority? Let's find out. Mm. Uh, as demonstrated in the working of His mighty strength. Next verse which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in heavenly places. So what happened? Jesus was raised from the dead and seated next to the Father in the heavenly throne room. But guess what? Because you are, what, in Christ, uh -huh, Ephesians 2.6 says, you had the same thing happen to you. Ephesians 2.6 uh, says this. Ephesians 2.6. And Ephesians 2 6. 2 1 is good, but we're going to 2 6. Ephesians 2 6. Here we go. Ephesians 2 6. Ah, and he raised us up together, what? With him, with Christ, uh huh, and made us sit down together. So, number one, we got raised. Number two, he raised you and stuck you on a seat. You didn't do it. He did it. He picked you up, pulled you right up into the throne room and made you sit on this seat. What seat did he put you on? Mm. Sit together. Gave us joint seating with Jesus. Mm. Why? Because you're in the throne room. You know what? I'm going to take a minute and explain this because you need to understand. Why do you have authority over the angels? Why? Can I explain it? Four hierarchies. Everybody say four hierarchies. four hierarchies. The first hierarchy was the pre-Adamic hierarchy. That was before Adam was created. That hierarchy was like this. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. God is a spirit. Below the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost was archangels. What archangels? Michael, Gabriel, Lucifer. Uh -huh. Below the archangels, their spirit, were regular angels. And below the regular angels was physical life on the earth. The scientists call them dinosaurs. But you don't believe in dinosaurs. Yes, I do. Why? It's in the Bible. The oldest book in the Bible is not Genesis. What's the oldest book in the Bible? Job. And Job talks about dinosaurs. So that was the hierarchy. But the animals were physical. Everybody say physical. physical. Then we get to hierarchy number two. God creates man. The physical animals could only operate in the physical world. And the spiritual angels could operate in the spirit world. And they can come in and out of the physical world, but they couldn't live there. Because to be legal in a physical world, you need a physical body. That's why even Satan needed a snake. Mm. That's why the demon-possessed man of Gadara, the demon said, put us in the pigs. To be legal, we've got to have some physical body to operate here. So what does God do? God does His greatest creation ever. Man. Why you say God's cre man's God's greatest creation? Because man is a spirit clothed in a flesh. So man can operate in the spirit realm and he can operate in the physical realm permanently. Are you getting a hold of this? Jesus, when he walked the earth, he walked the earth physically but operated in the spirit. How do you know? Because he said, I only say... What I hear my father say. God is a spirit. I only do what I see my father do. How did he see that? He was operating in the spirit. So you can do operate in both realms. 
And when he made man, he gave him so much power that he put him above not only the angels, not only the archangels, but even above, just below himself. So hierarchy number two, that's after Adam's created. Now you've got Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Right below that is man. He was ruler of this world. He was the king of the earth. Everything was subject to him. Even the angel said, what is man? What is man that you've created him and made him just a little lower than yourself? Mm. So now there's Father, Son, Holy Ghost, man, and below man comes archangels. Below archangels come angels. Below angels becomes the animal life that's on planet earth. And what did man do? He disobeyed God. His spirit shut down and he fell all the way down. Hierarchy number three. When man disobeyed God, this was in Genesis 3, what happened? The authority for earth was transferred, of course, you know that story, to Lucifer, who we call the devil, right? That's what happened. And man came all the way down. So hierarchy number three. We got Father, Son, Holy Ghost. You got archangels right there. Michael, Gabriel, then you've got angels, then you've got man. Because man was reduced to simply a human being. Everybody with me so far? And below man were animals. Jesus came to the cross, shed the blood for all the sins of mankind. What happened to man? He got raised. Amen. He got raised. Where did he go now? He didn't go uh, to the angel level. He didn't even go to the archangel level. He kept going. The elevator didn't stop there. The elevator went right to the top. Where did he go now? Seated in the throne room with Jesus himself. Hallelujah. Are you getting a hold of this? I like to call it, this is a heavy revelation, but God told me man became the fourth member of the Godhead. Wow! Even Adam didn't have a seat in the throne room. You got a seat with your name in it. Why is that important? Now the angels are below you. Before the angels were above you. And because the angels are below you, they're subject to you. Are you seeing this? That's why you have to know about the hierarchies. Now you can talk to the angels. You can commission the angels. You can decree the angels. You can tell them what to do because they're now below you. Are you getting a hold of this? Because you've got Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and man. All in the throne room. And below that you got archangels, Michael, Gabriel. Below that you got angels. Below that you got animal life. Once you understand who you are and where you're seated, everything changes. What did he do? He moved you up there. Go back to Ephesians uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 20. Ephesians, actually verse uh, uh, 18, I think it's verse 18. Ephesians 1, verse 18. And having the eyes of our heart flooded. Okay, go to verse 19. Mm -hmm. Verse 19. So that you can understand the surpassing greatness of his power. Go to verse 20. Now you're, he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him in his right hand. What, what, what is this place called the right hand? What, what is this place? This, this throne room. What is it? Everybody say the center of all authority and power in the universe. That's where you're seated. That's your authority. A, a, a policeman may not have the ability to stop a truck, but if he's got his uniform on and he puts his hand out, he has the authority to stop the truck. Not the physical ability, but the authority. Everybody say, I got the authority. Now you're getting a hold of this. You've got power and authority if you understand who you are. All right, uh, uh, next verse. Verse 21. Far above, the seat that you have is far above all <laughs> rule, authority, power, dominion, and every name that is named. COVID is a name. You're above that. You're above stroke. You're above cancer. You're above all of these things. That's why you don't need someone to lay hands on you to get healed. You got the power. Everybody say, I got the power. I got the power. Once you understand that, it'll change your world. Amen? Operate in the power you have. And not only in this age, this is what I love, but in the age to come. That means my seat in the throne room is permanent. I'm the fourth member of the Godhead. So when Jesus rules and reigns for thousands of years to come, I'm going to rule and reign with him. Are you getting a hold of this? 
because you're the fourth member of the Godhead. All right, in the age to come. Next verse. That's why angels are subject to you. Uh, and he has put, he, not you, he has put how many things under your feet? All. All. That's why COVID can't hurt you. It's under your feet. Every sickness is under your feet. No sickness can take you out if you won't let it. Stay in faith. Roland was with me in that hospital room with a stroke, and I was paralyzed on this side of my body. And you know what? Roland was with me even when I went to the Holy Land six weeks later, and they were helping me walk. But I tell you what, 12 weeks later, totally restored. How did that happen? Everybody shout, he got the power. You got the power. I got the power. I laid hands on myself and got healed. Left that hospital in five days. Walking out of that hospital. Why? Because I know how. See, see, we don't understand. We got the power. Look at, look at James 5.13. We need to operate in this power. James 5.13. James was the brother of Jesus. He lived with Jesus how long? Mm. All right. He lived with Jesus a long time. And guess what? Because he lived with Jesus, he's got the power. So is anyone among you sick? That's the word sick in the Greek. What did he say? If you're sick, find a pastor that can pray for you. No. Go to a Benny Hinn meeting. No. That's not what James said. James says, if you're sick, lay hands on yourself. He should pray. Who he? The sick person. We've not done that in the churches. We've said, everybody come to the ministry line. And I'm just as much at fault because that's what I used to do. Don't do that no more. You're sick? I'm going to teach you what to do to lay hands on yourself. Why? Because next week I could be in another town preaching. You better know what to do if that sickness comes back. You have the power to lay hands on yourself and get healed. Amen? That's why he says, is there any among you sick? Uh, he should pray. The rest of this verse says, uh, any among you happy? He should laugh and praise. You don't ask pastor to laugh for you. You're happy, you laugh. You don't ask pastor to smile for you. Why are you asking him to pray for you? You have the power. Next verse. Mm. Is anyone among you sick? This is a different word. This is bedridden. Everybody say bedridden. You're incapable of praying for yourself. Then you should call the church elders, uh, the spiritual guides, and uh, they should pray over him, anointing him with oil in the Lord's name. Why the Lord's name? So you can remember what happened where? At the cross. cross. What happened at the cross? He carried every sickness and every disease. So you don't need to carry it anymore. The Lord told me one day, it's pointless what I did at the cross if you won't enforce it. If he carried every sickness, why are you allowing sickness in your home? Why are you allowing sickness with your family? Why are you allowing sickness with your friends? Don't allow it no more. Everybody say, no more. more. Uh Uh-uh. Use that power that is in you. How do you mean that power in me? Next verse. And the prayer of faith. This is the word demand. Hmm. Of faith, of what you believe. So you've got to believe this. Everybody say, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. Then your demand. You're not demanding of God. Uh-uh. God's part is finished. When was all healing finished? At the cross. When was all prosperity finished? At the cross. When was all salvation finished? At the cross. All you're doing is you're going back to the cross and saying, Devil, let me remind you what happened at the cross. Jesus carried every sickness and every disease. So this sickness cannot stay on me anymore. It's got to go. You've got to command and you've got to demand. And when you command your body to line up with the Word, what does the Word say? He carried this sickness 2,000 years ago. So body, you line up with the Word of God, be whole and complete. That's what I did in the hospital room. Totally, completely restored of a stroke. The doctors in, in that hospital still have no understanding why I'm healed today. His name is Jesus. And what are you doing? Go to the next verse. Hmm. And if he has committed any sin, he'll be forgiven. Next verse. Verse 16. Confess to one another your faults. What does that mean? No more unforgiveness, jealousy, envy. That can't exist anymore. Because faith worketh through love. That's why it says here, the earnest heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes what? Tremendous power available. Where was that power all the time? Everybody say, in me. me. 
and that power in you. So I laid hands. The power in me came out of me through this hand and totally healed my face, totally healed my shoulder, totally healed my elbow, totally healed my hand. The power in me healed the body around me because I understood how to release it. Most Christians are still sick because, number one, they don't even know they got power. Number two, they're not laying hands on themselves. Number three, they don't actually believe. It's not the prayer of faith. It's the prayer of wishing, the prayer of hoping. Uh-uh. It needs to be the prayer of faith. Are you getting a hold of this? Why? You got the power. Once you understand that, everything changes. Everybody say, everything changes. Everything. Come with me to uh, uh, Malachi 3.11. Three, uh, 3, Malachi 3.11. Everybody say, Malachi. Malachi. Old, Testament. Old Testament. What happened in the Old Testament? They had no power. They were human beings. You are a spirit being. You're loaded with power. And I, says God, will rebuke the devourer. So who rebuked the devourer in the Old Testament? God. Why? Because they had no power. Today you don't do that. You're in another kingdom. And Jesus said these words, Matthew 16, 19. Mm. Matthew 16, 19. They were waiting on God to take care of the enemy. You don't need to do that. Matthew 16, 19. Jesus said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Not the keys to the kingdom, the keys that came from the kingdom. What should I do? I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom that whatsoever you bind. Not God. You're, you're waiting on God to change your situation. God's waiting on you to change your situation. It's not what God binds. It's what you bind. Well, how can I do this? How can I bind demons? Everybody shout, I got the power. I got the, power. I got the, authority. I got the authority. That's why they, they listen to you. You got power and authority. They didn't have that in the Old Testament. They were below the angels in the Old Testament. You're above the angels in the New Testament. Are you getting a hold of this? Because you have the power. So now when you say a word, those demons have to flee. Jesus had the power. How did he deal with all the demons? Look over at Matthew 8.16. This is how he dealt with the demons. Jesus was binding and loosing throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You've got to find out how he did it so you can do it. Mm. When evening came, they brought him many who were under the power of what? Demons. How did he get rid of those demons? He didn't fight nobody. The Bible says he drove out the spirits. How? With a word. A word. Everybody say a word. A word. He didn't get ten people together and say, let's fight this demon over this region. Uh-uh. He just said, get. That was it. Because he was operating in power. You have that power now. You can bind demons like that. Okay? And once he bound the demons, guess what happened? He was able to restore them to health. People got healed. Amen? All. Everybody say all. all. In other words, every demon was subject to Jesus and every angel was subject to Jesus. Today you are in the throne room. So let me say it again. Every demon is subject to you. Don't be afraid of demons. They're afraid of you. Amen. They're afraid that you might find out who you really are. Turn to your neighbor and say, Neighbor, neighbor. you're Clark Kent. You're go in the phone booth. <laughs> Come out as Superman. <laughs> You've been Superman all the time. You've been operating as Clark Kent. No more. Amen. No more. We got the power. Now go back, and now you can heal the sick because you got the power. When he said, Lay hands on the sick, he, why did he say, Lay hands on the sick? Those were unsaved. That was not saved Christians you lay hands on. You lay hands on the Buddhists. You lay hands on the Muslims. You lay hands on the, uh, the atheists. You lay hands on the Hindus. And they will get healed. Are you getting a hold of this? Most people think, oh, we can only heal Christians. No, that's not true. The, oh, heavy revelation. You ready for this one? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus never healed one Christian. What? There were no Christians. He never went to the cross. Not one person was a Christian. And yet he healed them all. Oh, come on now. <laughs> what are we waiting on? Let's go heal some Muslims and get them saved. Let, 
Can you get them healed first and saved later? I was healed on a Friday of shingles, and I was saved on Sunday. So God healed me as a Muslim two, three days before he saved me. So don't tell me he don't do that. I, I am a personal example that God can heal the unsaved if... Oh, now here's the, here's the problem. You're not the healer. And that's why we don't lay hands, because we know we're not the healer. Everybody say, I'm not the healer. I'm the, I'm the hand layer. Everybody do this. So if you don't stick one of these on somebody, <laughs> nobody's going to get healed. <laughs> you are the hand layer. Who have you laid your hands on lately? Hmm. And God will do the healing. Are you getting a hold of this? He'll flow the power from you to heal the unsaved. That's what we need in the church. And you're going to see us win the world like that. Go back to Matthew 16, 19. You have the power to bind. You have the power to loose. You have that power. Hmm. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, whatever you bind. Now, how do I bind? How do I bind? You've got to know how to bind because you're supposed to do this. Whatever you declare. Kings don't go to battle. Kings decree. You're the king that he's the king of. Start making some decrees. Oh, are you telling me, Brother Nasser, if I open my mouth and I make a decree, something will change? Nothing's going to change if I make a decree. Well, you forgot to read. Ha uh ha. -huh. Job, what was it? Do you remember? Two twenty. Two twenty six. Huh? 228? Is that it? Job 2, 22, 28. Job 22, 28. You shall what? Decide and what? Decree. And no one will listen to you. That's not what the Bible says. You will decree a thing. And what? It shall be established for you. Because we live in a voice activated system. That's why. So you can bind. How do I bind? By the words of my mouth. Jesus bound demons with what? A word. A word. Didn't do a 26 uh, point sermon. He just used one word. Got that demon out. So now go back to, to Matthew 16, 19. 16, 19. Matthew 16, 19. So we're talking about angels. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind, whatever you decree to be improper on the earth must be what is already bound in heaven. Is sickness allowed in heaven? No. Demons allowed in heaven? No. Poverty allowed in heaven? No. Then why do you allow it in your house? No more. No more. And then he says, whatsoever you loose is loose already in heaven. What do you loose? Do you loose two Two things. You lose angels and you lose people that have been bound by the demons. Isn't that what Jesus did? He got rid of the demons on those sick people with a word. So he loosed them. And then guess what? Every single one got healed. That's what you and I are supposed to do because we have the authority. We have the power. Everybody say, I got the power. See, once you understand that, all of a sudden you'll, you'll, you'll see, now I know why angels are subject to me. Because I am seated in the throne room. How many angels? Jeremiah 33, 22. How many angels? Jeremiah. Th go to Jeremiah. Where did I ask you to go? 33, 22. Here we go. As the host of the stars of heaven. Now the word star here means what? Angel. We found that out in Revelations 1.20. The stars were referring to angels. How many angels are there? Well, let's find out. <laughs> As the hosts, the stars. Remember, Jesus is the Lord of what? Hosts. This host of what? Angels. Uh -huh. As the host or the stars or the angels, the heavens cannot be what? Huh. When something can't be numbered, how many are there? I don't know. You can't count them. If there were seven billion, then each person on planet Earth would get one. If there were seven trillion, 
Each person on planet Earth that was saved, well, each person on planet Earth, assuming they're all saved, will get a thousand. The problem with seven trillion is this. It can still be numbered. What if it was seven hundred trillion? What if it was seven thousand trillion? What is, how many do you have now? Let's just take it to a minimum of seven trillion. If there's only seven trillion, and seven trillion is a number, so it's obviously more than that. But if it was only seven trillion, that means you have at least a thousand angels waiting for your instruction. What have you done with your thousand angels? They're not waiting on God's instruction, they're waiting on you. Because they're ministering spirits for the saints. That's you and I. I got a thousand angels. See, see, you're the king. You're the general. Why are you trying to do battle? Use the army that God gave you. And he gave you a ton of angels. Start using your angels for a variety of things. And I'll show you those things in just a second. Everybody say, I got the angels. Hebrews 1.14. They're waiting on your instruction. Can't number the angels. Are not the angels all ministering spirits, servants sent out in the service of God for who? Let's find out. The rest of this. For mm -hmm, the assistance of those who are to inherit salvation. Everybody shout, that's me. So you got a truckload of angels. you got a thousand angels waiting on you. What are we going to do with our thousand angels? Let's find out what angels can do. They're all sizes, and they do all kinds of things. Let's find out what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, Genesis 19.1. Genesis 19.1. Imagine if you only had two angels. What could two angels do? Hmm. It was evening when the two angels came to Sodom. Huh. Two angels. How many angels? Two, two. Two angels destroyed two cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. How many angels destroyed two cities? Two. Turn to your neighbor and say, you've got a thousand. What are you waiting on? Two angels can destroy two cities. What can we do? Amen? Hebrews 12, 22. Two angels did this. Mm. Hebrews 12, 22. But rather you have come to Mount Zion, even to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the countless multitude huh, of angels. How many angels? Countless. countless. How, that means you can't even count them. If you were sitting there going, mm, one million, mm, ten million, mm, hundred million, mm, one trillion, mm, five trillion, mm, two hundred million trillion, you still couldn't count them. Because they are countless mm, multitude. That's why I'm telling you, I, I, I make a joke that we've only got a thousand. But I'm sure God is laughing and saying, you have no idea how many angels I've actually given you. <laughs> it's way over a thousand. <laughs> but no one has taught us how to activate our thousand angels. Everybody say, it's time. It's time. Jesus couldn't fulfill the plan without activating the angels. Paul couldn't fulfill the plan without activating the angels. John couldn't fulfill the plan without activating the angels. Peter couldn't fulfill the plan without activating the angels. How in the world are you going to do it? Got to learn how to activate your thousands of angels. Amen? Okay, number one, they meet your physical needs. Put up there uh, Matthew 4.11. They meet your physical needs. If I've got physical needs, I can send my angels out to meet my physical needs. Then the devil departed, and the angels came and ministered to Jesus in the desert. Thirty-nine days of no eating and no drinking. What do you think he needed? Food and water. What do you think the angels brought him? Food and water. So you can send your angels out to bring your physical needs. Are you getting a hold of this? Not only that, let's find out what else the angels did. Hmm. Luke twenty-two forty-five. angels will give you strength. If 
you're struggling with some situation, uh, command your angels to give you strength. You have the strengthener in you. When he got up from prayer, he came, found the disciples uh, sleeping. Luke 22, mm -hmm. next verse. And he said to them, why do you sleep? Get up and pray that you may not enter temptation. Next verse. And while he was still speaking, behold, oh, let's back up some verses because obviously it was the verse before. 22, Luke 22, oh, 43. Did I say 45? My apologies. Luke 22, 43. And there appeared to Jesus, what? An angel. What did the angel come to do? Strengthen him. You need strength? Have you called on your angels to strengthen you? You can. You can do that. All right. What else can the angels do? Go over to 10, uh, Acts 10, verse 1. They give supernatural guidance. They can show you how to get answers. Hmm. Living in Caesarea was a man called Cornelius, a centurion that was known as the Italian regiment. Next verse. Verse 2. The devout man who venerated God treated him with reverential obedience as did all his household, and he gave. Everybody say, he's a giver. And he prays. Everybody shout, he prays. What do you think he prayed for? Hmm? Everybody say, he was influential. Everybody say, he was loaded. He wasn't praying for money. <laughs> he was a generous giver. You can't be a generous giver if you're broke. So he was loaded. He had wealth. That's not what he was praying for. What was he praying for? God, I want to know you more. That was his prayer. And what happened? His prayer was answered. Next verse. Hmm. The ninth hour of the day he saw the clearly a vision of what? An angel. And an angel showed up because he said, I want to know you more. And what did the angel do? Give direction. Entered saying to him, Cornelius. Next verse. Gazing intently at him, became frightened and said, What is it, Lord? And the angel said, Your prayers and your giving to the poor have come up as a sacrifice to God and have been remembered by God. So God answered his prayer with an angel. Now the angels do not know or even understand the gospel message. You've got to understand, they're spirit beings. So they have no understanding of how Jesus went to the cross so, so man could be saved? What does that mean? So they don't know that. They understand the cross. So God has to use a person to bring the gospel message. Angels can't do that. Angels can connect you with somebody that can bring the gospel message. So the angel was sent to Cornelius to connect him with Peter. Are you getting a hold of this? So when you pray, God releases angels to connect you with people. Can I say that slowly? When you pray, God uses angels to connect you with people. FedEx does not pick up from heaven. Your next house, your next car, your next building, your next financial breakthrough is not in heaven. It's already on the earth right now. Where? In the hands of men. And the moment you sow or obey the word of God, God commissions angels to influence men to come pour into your bosom the harvest of your prayer. Are you getting a hold of this? He commissions angels to give you favor. And I'm going to have uh, one of my spiritual daughters now <laughs> share a testimony at the end about supernatural favor that came because the angels went out and created that favor with men. Are you getting a hold of this? The angel gave Cornelius supernatural guidance. What was that? Get a hold of Peter. All right. Then what else can I give you? All right. We already talked about... Well, go to Acts 8.26. I circled Acts 8.26, so we'll go there as well. Acts 8.26. But an angel of the Lord said to Philip, <laughs> Rise and proceed southward or at midday to the road. Now, now, you know what's really strange? Can I share with you something really strange? Are you ready for this? Back up three verses. Hmm. Mark 
No, no, don't back up three verses. Back up ten verses. Where are we? Ten verses. No, 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 no. Ten verses. Go back to Acts 8, uh, 10. Let's see what Acts 8, 10 says. Hmm. Acts 8, 10. I want to show you what just happened. Hmm. Uh-uh. No, back up to Acts 8, <laughs> 8, 6. Let's go to 8, 6 and see what happened. Hmm. Great, great. Oh, this is great. Let's go to, yeah. The great crowds of people with one accord listened and heeded to what was said by who? Philip. Philip. Mm. And what happened? Ha uh ha. -huh. They heard him and watched the miracles and wonders. Everybody say, great crowds, great, great, crowds. Miracles. Great, miracles. great miracles. This was an awesome miracle crusade in Samaria. And incredible things happened. Next verse. He kept performing. Who kept performing? Philip. Mm. Foul spirits came out of those that were possessed by them, screaming and shouting. And many who were suffering palsy were crippled, were restored to health. Next verse. And there was what? Great rejoicing in the city. What does that tell you? We had a city-wide crusade and the entire city rejoiced. Right after the city rejoiced, who were they rejoicing for? Philip. Philip, that was incredible. You're an awesome man of God. I mean, you, you, you are definitely God's man for the hour. You're making this thing happen. And in the middle of all these accolades, the angel shows up. Right in the middle of this great crusade. Hmm. Acts 8, 26. Just finished a great crusade. People healed, delivered, set free. The entire city is rejoicing. And the angel says, enough of this rejoicing. we got work to do. <laughs> Pulled him out of a rejoicing city. Rise up, Philip. Uh, we got other projects for you to do. Are you getting a hold of this? God's got a lot of projects for you to do. Don't dwell on the success of yesterday. God's got something bigger tomorrow. What happened? Philip, go down to Gaza. This is the desert route. Next verse. So Philip immediately instructed by what? An angel. Hmm. He got up and went down and behold, there on that road was an Ethiopian eunuch of great authority under Candace the queen who was in charge of all of her treasure, had come to Jerusalem to worship. You've done a great crusade here in Samaria. Now go down this road. You're going to meet this guy. What am I supposed to do with this one guy? I mean, I'm being celebrated in this city, and you're telling me to leave town? Yep, leave town. Hmm. And he was now returning and sitting in his chariot, reading the book of the prophet Isaiah. Next verse. Then the Holy Spirit said to Philip, Go forward and join yourself to this chariot. The Holy Spirit, you know why the Holy Spirit said that? He was in the right place. What got him in the right place? The angel. The angel, mm. the angel will get you in the right place at the right time to meet the right people. Are you getting a hold of this? Get you favor with the right people at the right time. Angel did this. Now watch this. It gets even better. Huh? Next verse. Verse 31. The next verse, what happens? Let's find out. Isaiah, and then asks, do you really understand what you're reading? That's what Philip asked this eunuch. Next verse. And the eunuch said, how is it possible for me to understand unless someone explains it and guides me? And he earnestly requested Philip to come up, sit beside him and tell him, what is this all about? Next verse. Now, this was the passage of the scripture he was reading. Like a sheep he was led to slaughter, and as a lamb before it sheared is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Who was he talking about? Jesus. What was he bringing? The gospel message. Because angels can't give you the gospel message. They can put you to someone who can give you the gospel message. Now, look at this. Uh huh. Next verse. 
He was taken away distressed. Go to the next verse. And the eunuch said to Philip, I beg of you, tell me about whom does this prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Next verse. And Philip opened his mouth and beginning with the portion of scripture, he announced to him the glad tidings of the gospel of Jesus. Isn't that exciting? No. Let me tell you what's exciting. The eunuch went home to where? Ethiopia. And was he Jew? Yes, he was, because he had come to Jerusalem to worship. That's what the Jews did. Because there were a truckload of Jews in Ethiopia. And he brought to Ethiopia the message of the gospel of Jesus. Watch this. In 1947, 1948, when Israel opened up, Jews from all over the world came to Israel. And a truckload of Jews showed up from Ethiopia. Black African American Jews. Why did they come? Because they were converted to Christianity and they couldn't understand why the other Jews didn't worship Jesus. How did all these Jewish Ethiopians get converted? The eunuch. Because one man was led by an angel to go and see one eunuch who went back to Ethiopia, converted all the Jews in Ethiopia, and when they came in 1947, they couldn't understand why all the other Jews didn't worship Jesus. Because they were all saved. Why? If I shout angels, angels. find out how to use your angels. They've been waiting on you. They can give you guidance. They can give you instruction. They can give you supernatural protection. Come with me to Acts 5, 17. Are you getting something tonight? Angels. Angels. Hmm. Acts 5, 17. But the high priest rose up and all were his supporters. That is the party of the keep going, Sadducees, the Sadducees, and being filled with jealousy and indignation and rage. Next verse. They seized and arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. Everybody say, in jail. In jail. Huh, they're in jail. And during the night, what happened? An angel showed up. They're in jail. Somebody prayed. Get them out of jail. And how was that prayer answered? An angel. Hmm. Come on now. Angel of the Lord opened the prison doors, leading them out, saying what? What did he say? Go take your stand where? At the temple. You're supposed to preach the gospel. You're not supposed to be in jail. <laughs> Took them out of jail and said, now go back there and preach the gospel. That's your purpose, not jail. Are you getting a hold of this? Mm. Got them delivered. Got them out of jail. The angel got them out. No, no, no. Wait a minute. The angel just did not give them an instruction. The angel got them out of a locked jail. That's how powerful your angels are. You're in jail? Don't worry about it. The angels will get you out. Angels will get you out. People will wonder, how in the world did that happen? Come with me to Acts. Do we want to go to Acts 12? Well, I got Acts 12 circled, so let's go over there. Acts 12, verse 1. Learn about your angels, who they are, what they are, what they can do. Hmm. About that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to afflict and oppress and torment those, some of those that belong to the church assembly. Verse 2. And he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. Not a good thing. Hmm. Verse 3. And when he saw that it was pleasing to the Jews, he proceeded further and arrested what? Peter. Peter. Why did he arrest Peter? Everybody say, to kill him. He killed the other one. He's going to kill Peter now. Okay. This was during the days of the unleavened bread, the Passover week. Next verse. And when he had seized Peter, he put him in prison. Everybody say, prison. And delivered him and delivered him to four squads of soldiers. That means four times four. Sixteen armed guards 
protected one unarmed Peter. Seriously. Hmm. For each to guard him, purposing after the Passover to bring him forth to the people and kill him. That was Herod's plan. Next verse. So Peter was kept in prison. But what was happening? Fervent what? Prayer. Prayer. Hmm. What were they praying? Get Peter out. God, get Peter, Peter out. Get him freed from that prison. They're going to kill him if he stays there. So prayer went to heaven. Hmm. What happened? Was made to God by the church assembly. They were actually in somebody's house. It was kind of a prayer meeting going on in this house. They're praying for Peter to be released. The very night before Herod was about to bring him forth, Peter was sleeping. Everybody say sleeping. sleeping. Can you imagine? They're about to kill you. And what are you doing? Chilling out. What did Jesus do in the middle of the storm? Sleep. Come on. Trust in your angels. Come on. Sleeping between two soldiers. That means he wasn't just sleeping in the prison. He was sleeping here. Next to him was a soldier sleeping. Next to him was the other soldier sleeping. They were making sure he was not going to get out. Hmm. Fastened with two chains. On top of the soldiers, he got chains on him. Hmm. And centuries were standing at the door that were not sleeping. At the door inside and at the door outside. There were two standing inside and 12 standing outside. 16 soldiers guarding him in prison. Next verse. They prayed and suddenly who appeared? How powerful is this angel? Let's find out. The angel appeared, angel of the Lord, standing beside him. And a light shone in that place where he was. And the angel gently smote Peter. Hmm. On the side and awakened him. And saying, get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. Isn't it interesting? Not one of the soldiers woke up. The chains fell off his hands, which means they fell on the ground. That wasn't carpeted. Hello, somebody. <laughs> Hit the ground. Stone ground. Clang! And not one soldier woke up. Get up. The chains fell off his hands. Next verse. And the angel said. So the angel not only spoke to him and told him to get ready. The angel now made sure that those guys never woke up. And blinded the eyes of the soldiers that were standing by the door. Hmm. Tighten your belt. Bind your sandals. And he did so. Wrap your outer garment around. So he got up. Put on his sandals. Put on his garments while these two soldiers were sleeping next to him. Next verse. Peter went out following the angel. That means they went out of the prison door. Which prison door? The one that was guarded by 12 soldiers. And not one soldier saw him go out. Went to the gate of the prison that was guarded by soldiers. Not one soldier at the gate saw them go out. That's how much power your angels have. What are you doing with your angels? Yeah. Next verse. Hmm. And when they had passed through the first guard and the second, nobody saw them. They came to the iron gate which leads to the city. Of its own accord, the gate opened up. The doors opened up. The chains fell. And nobody saw it happen. And they went out past on through the street. And at once the angel left. What was the angel's job? Get him out. Did the angel get him out? Absolutely. Has the angel got you out of trouble? Are you using your angels to get you out of trouble? You can. That's what they're there for. Prayed and the angels answered. Everybody say, they prayed. prayed. The angels answered. Come with me to Matthew 28, 2. Angels do superhuman feasts. They can do some incredible things. If you understand what your angels can do. They can literally create earthquakes. That's what we read this morning. The angels stepped down. 
Boom, earthquake. Behold, there was a great earthquake. Why? For, for. That means because. There was an earthquake because. Because of what? <laughs> an angel of the Lord descended from heaven. Can you imagine coming down from heaven and landing on the ground and an earthquake occurs? It's how big your angels are. I believe when Paul and Silas were praying in the prison, I believe an angel came down. There was an earthquake. All the doors flung open. All the chains flew open. Why? Because an angel decided to land right there. That's how big your angels are. Create earthquakes. Your angels, your angels, and rolled back the boulder and sat upon it. In other words, the angel moved this boulder that men could not move in groups of four. Just moved it and sat on it. That's how big your angels are. Get this image inside of you. Your angels are powerful. Your angels are huge. And your angels have incredible things they can do for you. And they are sent to be your assistants. They are sent to be your servants. They're sent to assist you to fulfill God's plan for your life. And if you think God's plan for your life is so small that you can do it by yourself, it isn't God. God don't, turn to your neighbor and say, God don't think that small. <laughs> to fulfill God's plan, you're going to need to use your angel. That's why we're having this conference. The plan that God has for you is so big that you're going to need your angels to get your harvest, to move uh, mountains out of the way, to literally create situations, to break the chains, to bring people into your life, to get you favor in every situation. Your angels can do that. Amen? Learn how to activate your angels. What did we learn this morning? Matthew 13, 39. Say this after me. My angels, my angels. are my reapers. Amen. When was the last time you sent your angels to bring in your harvest? They, the harvest stands ready, but it's waiting for reapers. Go send your angels out. Can you see angels? 2 Kings 6.17 2 Kings 6.17 Elisha prayed, Lord, open his eyes. So this servant, Gehazi, got to see... I always wonder about this guy. The servant. Why do you wonder about Gehazi, the servant? Elisha, Elijah had a servant called Elisha. Everybody with me so far? He served Elijah faithfully. And his reward was double the anointing of the prophet Elijah. Have you got a hold of this? That means double the miracles, double everything. Gehazi was Elisha's servant. He was about to get double the anointing of Elisha. And he walked away from it for a few shekels. After his eyes had been opened. And he saw armies of angels on chariots of fire. He gave away what was coming to him for a few shekels. Sold it away. That's why I wonder about this guy. Hmm. And the Lord opened the young man's eyes. He was a young man. And he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses, chariots of fire around Elisha. That's what he could have got if he had understood. But he sold himself out for a few shekels of silver. Everybody say, what a shame. What a shame. What a shame. Psalms 91. We were there this morning. We had a good time in Psalms 91 this morning. Your angels can protect you. But you're going to have to do something to get the protection of your angels. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High uh -huh, shall abide under and fix under the shadow of the Almighty. Don't you want protection everywhere you go? 
Don't you want protection for your family, for your children, and for your grandchildren? Don't you want protection? Then move under the secret place of the Most High. How do I get under that place? Next verse will tell you how to do it. We live in a voice activated system. So to get under God's protection for the angels to protect you, you're going to have to do verse 2. I will say. Everybody say, I got to say. Uh, can I make it real simple? Say this after me. I got to say something to something for something to happen. You got to say something to something for something to happen. Because we live in a voice-activated system. You're not under God's protection because you happen to memorize this scripture. You're under God's protection because you did verse 2. I will say of the Lord, what will you call the Lord? He is my refuge. He is my fortress. And the moment I open my mouth, your angels go. And the fortress, the refuge, comes all over you. Your angels bring it and put it over you because you now commission the angels by the words of your mouth. You didn't say what you wanted. You didn't say, help me, Lord. You said, I am under, I'm calling the Lord my refuge. I'm calling the Lord my fortress. And the moment you quoted scripture, the angels brought that refuge, that fortress, and put it all over you. It happened the moment you opened your mouth and spoke the word of God. He is my refuge. He is my fortress. My God. On Him I lean and rely. In Him I will trust. Next verse. The moment you said those words, the angels put you under that fortress. Then. For then. Everybody say, after I speak. speak. Everybody say, after. After. The angels angels that I've commissioned commissioned. put me me in in that fortress. Then this happens. He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. Nothing can touch me. COVID-19 can't touch me. Plagues can't touch me. And from the deadly pestilence. When will this happen? After I'm under the fortress. How did I get under the fortress? The moment you opened your mouth, spoke the word, your angels put that over you. You are now covered. You are now protected. So I speak this over me and my whole family Every single day. And I speak it over many of you because you're spiritual sons and daughters. So I'm speaking this over you. Are you speaking this over your family? Okay, watch this. Next verse. For then, because you did verse 2, now He will cover you with His pinions. Then. What does then mean? Because you did verse 2, you now get this next verse. He will cover you with His pinions. And under His wings, you will trust and find refuge. His truth and His faithfulness are a shield and a buckler. Why? Because you did verse 2. Now you're totally protected. Next verse. Because you did verse 2, you shall not be afraid. Everybody shout, no more fear. Why? Because I spoke verse 2. And I fully expect my angels to put me under his fortress. Because he is my refuge. He is my fortress. He's not your refuge and fortress. Well, let me put it this way. He is a refuge and fortress available to you, but not for you till you declared it. Can I, make, can I say that again slowly? He is a refuge and he's a fortress for you. But it doesn't happen to you till you make the declaration. Why? Your declaration moves the angels. <laughs> That's your declaration of independence. I like that. That's your declaration of independence. That's your declaration of protection. But without the declaration, there was no protection. Next verse. You'll not be afraid of the terror by night. You'll not be afraid of COVID-19. Uh-uh. Or the slanders of the wicked. Nor of the pestilence that stalks in the darkness. Nor of the destruction and sudden death that surprise and lay waste at noonday. A thousand may fall. 
I don't, I don't want to know the statistics, how many people. You know, they just keep pumping you with statistics, how many people died because of COVID. You know what they forget to tell you? How many lived? 99.75% recovered from COVID. You know what they forget to tell you? That the previous year, more people died from a flu than last year died from COVID-19. They forgot to tell you that. Because they want you to be in fear. And what you fear will come upon you. No more fear. Everybody shout, no more fear. Everybody say, I'm under His protection. Because you declared it. I declare this every single day. No plane will ever go down because I've got my angels with me everywhere I go. They're protecting that plane. Not going to get into a car accident. I keep my angels with me everywhere I drive. And I won't exceed the speed limit, so they'll stay with me. <laughs> they get off the car when you exceed the speed limit. You want to speed? Go ahead. <laughs> we'll catch up to you later. <laughs> stay the speed limit. Mm. Next verse. Come on, let's finish this. Mm. Only a spectator will you be. When they came out with COVID, guess what? I always tell people, hug me, because the anointing on me will kill the COVID on you. I'm not afraid of COVID. I put on a mask. Why? Because I have to on a plane. But outside of that, I'm not concerned. Why? Can't touch me. T.L. Osborne went all the way to Africa in a worse pandemic than COVID-19. And they put it on his hand, and the anointing on his hand killed every germ. They got on his hand. Everybody shout, I got that anointing. What anointing that destroys every yoke of bondage. You got it. And you're afraid of what? Come on now. No more. Everybody shout, no more. No more fear. Uh huh. I am just a spectator. That's what you are. Yourself inaccessible. <laughs> I love that. Everybody say, I'm inaccessible. Why? Because I'm in the secret place of the Most High. How did I get there? I made a declaration and the angels put me in that secret place. That's why you've got to use your angels every single day. Next verse. I only see what the reward are going to get, the w wicked are going to get. Why? Why? How did I make the Lord my refuge? By the words of my mouth. By what? Voice activated system. <laughs> Are you getting a hold of this? Now watch this. Because you did this, your angel started moving. That's why it says in verse 10, There shall be no evil before you or any plague or calamity come near your tent. What's going to stop the plague or the calamity? For he has given his what? They put you under the fortress. They put you under the protection. And they surround you so nothing can touch you. Who protects you? His angels. When did they protect you? Verse 2. When you made your declaration. Are you getting a hold of this? You need to do this every day over your family. Every day. Devil tried to take out my sister with bladder cancer. Couldn't. She was 12 hours. How many hours? 12. 12 hours from death. They said she would not be alive in the morning. That's how close she was to death. Well, guess what? She's alive and well, vacationing in Spain. Come on, somebody. I couldn't be in London, England at that hospital, but I could send my angels. Angels, say this after me. Angels, angels. Move, move at the speed, at the speed. of thought. You can think it, and your angels are right there in the Philippines taking care of what they're supposed to do. That's how fast they move. Amen? But you've got to have to give them direction. You have to give them instruction. And they only know one language. What language is that? The Word of God. Amen? Are you seeing this? Uh-huh. He's, he's given His angels charge over you. To accompany you. Everybody say, accompany me. accompany me. The good news is they're with you everywhere you go. The bad news is if you don't quote the word, 
they're sitting idle on the sidelines <laughs> while you're going through persecution, while you're going through all kinds of hardship, when they could have been sitting there doing whatever you needed them to do, but you never learned how to activate your angels. That's why you need to get these series. You need to listen to them over and over and over again till you get it on the inside. I live this every day of my life. Don't leave my house without activating my angels. They're out there doing my bidding. They're getting me favor with people. They're getting me favor everywhere I go. I go to the mall, and just as I'm driving to the front door, somebody pulls out. Think, Thank you, angels. Move him out. I want that spot. You're kidding. You don't actually believe that, do you? Did you take 299 verses out of the Bible? When did you become the unbeliever you are now? 299 verses on angels and you don't believe in angels? We need to get you saved again. <laughs> of course I believe in angels. Who wouldn't believe in angels? How many scriptures do you need to learn to believe in angels? Everybody say, they are my protection. Your angels are your protection. They will keep you safe. Amen? And fallen angels are actually the demons that you can bind. Okay? How do you know? Go over to uh, Hebrews 2.16. Hebrews 2.16. That's who Satan took. He took some of the angels and disobeyed God, kicked out of heaven. Isaiah says they fell to the earth like lightning. For as we all know, Christ did not take hold of angels, the fallen angels, to give them a helping hand, a delivering hand. But he did take a hold of the fallen descendants of Abraham. That's you and me, to reach out to them in a helping hand. So there are fallen angels. What's another word for fallen angels? Everybody shout demons. demons. And you have authority over them. Remember, you're in the seat of authority. Start using that seat to move those angels. Come, angels love to worship. Hebrews 1 6. Hebrews 1 6. Angels love to worship God. Moreover, being the firstborn son again into the habitable world, he says, Let all the angels of God what? Worship him. Angels love to worship. They, they were created to worship. In fact, I'll go one step further. I'll tell you something. You were created to worship. What's the difference between me and angels? Angels were told to worship. You have a choice. But how many people are saved because of the blood of Jesus? And they have no time to worship the one who saved them. We can learn from the angels. Angels are always worshiping God. They go around the throne room going, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. They throw their crowns on the floor. They love to worship the Creator. And He didn't send Jesus for the angels. He sent Jesus for you. And we get so busy that we don't ever have time to worship. Some of you guys came to my house, I think, a week ago Monday. And what did we do that night, Roland? We worshipped God. And God was pleased because he, he has been waiting. Can I say this? He has been waiting 2,000 years for you to come boldly to the throne room so he could hang out with you and you could worship him. We take the blood, we take the healing, we take all the prosperity, but we have no time to worship him. Tomorrow night, we're going to worship him in this place. You see what God's going to do during that worship time. Incredible things are going to happen tomorrow night as we worship him. We're going to devote time just to worship God. See what's going to happen. Angels love to worship God. Everybody say, I love, I love. To, worship to worship God. Now you've got to avoid flaky angels. 
There are flaky angels. Yeah, we call them demons. Come with me to Matthew 24, 35. You better know the word. Or you'll be influenced to say something by a flaky angel. Can I give you another name for a flaky angel? The devil. Demons. They'll whisper in your ear and you'll think, oh, that sounds like God. Did you know the devil can quote scripture? Did you know that? Did you know the devil was there when all this was put together, when God created heaven and earth? The devil saw it happen. He knows the power of the word. And he'll quote a scripture so you'll actually believe it, but it will be out of context. What will he quote? Oh, throw yourself and the angels will protect you. No, I'm not going to throw myself. <laughs> Turn this stone into water. That's what, isn't that what uh, uh, God did in the, in the desert? No, 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 no. We're going to do the right thing. Look at this. Sky and earth will pass away, but not my words. They will not pass away. God's, what is the language of eternity? The Word. Well, you know, you know, Christians are going to be in shock when they get to heaven. They're thinking it'll be a, 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 a bungalow with, f you know, four bedrooms and 12 bathrooms and, you know, sit on the veranda on the rocking chair. That's what I'm going to do in heaven. There are no houses in heaven. It's a spirit realm. There's, God's not your contractor. Mm. <laughs> Hector is your contractor. But God's not your contractor. He ain't up there building you a house. He created for you a place. Not in heaven. In the body of Christ. That's why he said, I will come back and take you to me. He didn't say, I will come back and take you to heaven. But that's false doctrine. That's doctrines of men. You study John 14, verse 1, 2, 3, 4. You'll find out, he says, I'm going to come back and take you to me. You will be my body. I will go to prepare a place. And you know what? Translators have turned that into a four-bedroom bungalow. God don't build houses. You don't need houses. You have an incorruptible body. What in the world? You ain't even going to get tired. You ain't even going to fall asleep. Have you any idea what kind of a body you're going to have? With the Word? You don't need all that junk. Oh yeah, I can't wait to be on my rocking chair in heaven. <laughs> No, <laughs> please don't insult my intelligence and make me think less of you. <laughs> Study the Word. It's all there in the Greek in John 1, 14, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Are you getting a hold of this? Uh, so why did I tell you that? The Word. You know what's going to be in heaven? Classrooms. And you know what you're going to do in heaven? You're going to study what? The Word. Because that's the language of eternity. You can't rule and reign without the Word. And you're going to rule and reign for millenniums to come. But you ain't going to rule nothing until you first learn the Word. <laughs> Are you getting a hold of this? And we'll be in class with Jesus teaching. We'll all be in one class. Can you imagine how big that classroom is going to be? We're going to be in that classroom and Jesus is going to teach all day. And they would have already collected all the watches at the door. <laughs> Isn't it lunchtime? No. Not finished teaching. Okay. Sit down. <laughs> you need to learn the word. Next verse. But you're talking about flaky. Here's flaky. But of that exact day and hour. What day and hour? Not even the angels of heaven know. What hour? When Jesus comes back. Angels don't know. Jesus don't know. The Holy Spirit don't know. Hmm. Nor the Son. Only the Father knows. I actually, I don't know if you remember. Some of you have been around as long as I have, so you know, you might remember. There was a book out. It says, Jesus coming back in 1988. Wrote a book. Sold tons of it. Anybody remember that book? Yeah. Sold tons of those books. And guess what? Jesus never came back in 1988. Do so you think the guy would be embarrassed? He would apologize, give everybody their money back. No. He went back, wrote another book. Jesus coming in 1989. <laughs> this is a true story. Did he hear it? Yes, he did. How did he hear it? Demon. Why? It doesn't match the Word. 
How do I know what I'm hearing is really God talking to me? Have you ever studied the Word? If you've studied the Word, you can say, what I heard from God matches the Scripture. But if it don't match the Scripture, I'm not going to accept it. It was a flaky angel. Stop following flaky angels. But you can't follow any angel. You can't even listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit until you know the Word. Because you must always discern. Everybody say discern. discern. Oh, the Lord is telling me to tell you this. Everybody say, God, God used, a used a donkey to speak. To speak. You know that, right? God gave me a word for you. I'm a prophet. No, no. You're right there with the donkey. That'll keep people humble. God can speak through anybody, including a donkey. So if he gave you a word, probably you're right there at the level of that donkey. It don't make you a prophet. It's amazing how many people call themselves, they've got it on their business card. I'm a prophet. You're not a prophet because you put it on your business card. Well, did God did speak to me one time and, I, and I, I shared it with somebody and they said, yeah, that's true. So I must be a prophet. No, you are donkey's companion. <laughs> Get out of pride. Even a donkey can be used. Amen? Is it okay to stay with the word? There's too much junk out there. No more. If you don't have the word to back up what you're saying and you can't give me a scripture, I don't want to hear it. And it better be a rightly divided word. Because if you can rightly divide it, surely you can wrongly divide it. And it better be one in context. Amen? That's why the Bible says we need to what? Study to show ourselves what? Approved. No more flakiness. Not in the church. Amen? And no more baby angels. Get past that. There ain't no baby angels that are out there reproducing. There's no such thing as a baby angel. In fact, your angels are huge. When they jump down in front of you, an earthquake happens. That's pretty big, huh? You've got huge angels assigned to you and thousands of them. What are you doing with your angels? We've got this silly image of, they paint this image of little baby angels fluttering. What's that angel going to do for you? Nothing. There's no baby angels. God didn't create angels to reproduce. Angels cannot reproduce. They just are. And when they were created, they were full grown. They don't grow any taller. They don't grow any shorter. They don't grow any older. Because in the spirit realm, you don't age. Angels are coming from a non-time realm. There is no time in the spirit realm. God is not was or God will be. God is. That's why his name is what? I am. Because the spirit realm, there is no time. He doesn't grow older. He doesn't go younger. Come on now. He just is. Because in the spirit realm, there is no time. All the time is present. It's always in the present. It's only in the natural realm we have this thing called a block of time. And we age in time, but not in the spirit realm. In the spirit realm, you'll be approximately 33 years old, and you'll be good looking, and you will not be overweight. You'll have all your hair back, <laughs> and it won't be gray. <laughs> That's how you're going to look <laughs> in the spirit realm. Amen? So start seeing things the way they really are in the spirit realm, not the way they say or the, the world says it's going to be. Let's see. Have you been getting anything tonight? Go to 1 Peter 1.12. Angels can help you get people saved. But angels cannot get people saved. But when you get somebody saved, your entire thousand angels have a party. Did you know that? They actually rejoice when one comes into the kingdom. Because you have added one more. Ooh, can I say it? You've added one more to the throne room. You've added one more to the throne room. 
And we, we studied, I think yesterday we found the scripture that says, uh, when you persecute a child, the, the child's angel is coming before the father. Be careful. Judgment will come. Don't mess with God's babies. Train them up in the word. Okay? That's your job. But don't persecute them. Because they've already been appointed an angel. That means even before you got saved, you were appointed an angel. I, I can't begin to tell you before I got saved how many near-death experiences I had. And I don't know why I'm here, but now I know. Because that angel that was watching over me before I got saved was with me and saving me in different situations. How many of you can say, even before you got saved, you had near-death experiences and came out? How did that happen? The angel. Now, how did the angel do that? Because God told him to protect you. Why do some Christians die? Mm. Good question. Can I answer it? Okay, this is a serious answer. And you probably will not love me after. Okay, say this after me. Brother Nasser, Brother Nasser. we love you. I got it on tape now. You, you can't take it back. God meets you at your level of revelation. Brand new Christian, don't know nothing from nothing. Incredible things happen. Now you've been a Christian five years. Why don't things happen instantly for you? Because God actually expects you to live what you know. I got healed like that. When my wife had multiple sclerosis, she got healed within two years. How come I got healed in two weeks and she got healed in two years? She had to walk out the word that she knew. Why is that bad news? You hang around me, come to my conferences, come to my meetings, listen to all my CDs, you're going to learn a truckload of word. But God's going to expect you to live it. If you live it, you'll see the fruit. Amen. God actually expects you to live. See, you got to get from the out the other side. Mm. Lord, how do I say this? You're on the receiving end of the desk. Bless me, Lord. Help me, Lord. I'm sick. Help me, Lord. I'm broke. I need a car. I need this. I need that. Get out of that seat. Go on the other side of the desk and say, Lord, all my needs are met because you said so. Now use me to bless other people. Are you getting a hold of this? How can I change someone else's life? How can I give them the Word? How can I get them filled with the Holy Ghost? How can I help them to grow? How can I help them to see life more abundantly? That's why you were put in the body of Christ. How can I set these people free from the spirit of fear that they're in on my, in my house or in my workplace? You can do that. You can bind that spirit of fear from operating. You have the power. You're to bind and loose. You're to set the captives free. You're to get the blind sight. Good news to the poor. That's what you're supposed to do. Jesus said, the things that I do, so will you do, and even greater. You're to loose your angels and bind demons that are oppressing people right now. That are giving sickness to people right now. With a word, you're supposed to change your world, not just leave your world. You're supposed to bring God's kingdom to the earth. Amen. Thy kingdom come. Where? On earth. As it is where? Amen. You're supposed to change earth, not just leave earth. Too many Christians got their bags packed waiting on Jesus to come. I'm out of here. And God's going, no, I got much more work for you to do. <laughs> Everybody shout, unpack. Unpack. <laughs> We've got too much to do. And what's he doing? He's giving us Jesus so we're born again. He's given us Jesus so we have the seat of authority. He's given us the Holy Spirit so that we're filled with power. He's given us the wisdom of God. And then he's given us an army of angels to direct, to bring his kingdom on the earth. Say this after me. The Spirit of the Lord, the of the Lord is, upon me is upon me to bring good news, bring good news to, the poor, to the poor, 
sight to the blind, freedom to the captive, and to declare the acceptable year of the Lord, the year of Jubilee, the year of restoration. I only bring good news everywhere I go to bind the demons and loose the angels and bring his kingdom to the earth. Are you seeing this? That's why we're teaching on angels. So you will be equipped. He gave you Jesus. He gave you the Holy Spirit. And then he gave you an army of angels. Now change this world with what I've given you. And that's why I've been teaching on angels. Last December, 12 CDs. This one, 12 CDs. And I haven't finished. I've still got more. So I have a feeling that the prayer conference is going to be about angels. <laughs> is this helping anybody? Yes. If you, and, and you know what? The difference is I'm not trying to teach you what I know so you will just live it. I'm trying to teach you what I know so you will teach other people. You are supposed to be teachers of one another. You're supposed to prepare other people. You're supposed to get them doing what I'm teaching you. So you're supposed to take this knowledge. You're supposed to live this word and then go share it with somebody else. When we set up the ministry, God said, have a copyright policy in this ministry. You know what our copyright is? Copy it right. <laughs> Go teach somebody else. Don't become, and, and I say this with all humility because I'm not trying to pick on anybody. Don't become what we have an abundance of in Tulsa, fat Christians. And I ain't talking about physically fat. I'm talking about spiritually fat. They ain't sharing nothing with nobody. They ain't getting the unsaved saved. They're not getting the captives free. They're not getting sight to the blind. They're waiting for the next ministry line so they can go and get hands laid on them so they can run the aisles, roll on the floor, and get somebody else to get them healed. Uh, are, you, are you getting a hold of what I'm saying? We are to equip other people to become sons of God, not children of God. I don't know anybody sick. Which cave have you been living in? <laughs> you cannot live on planet earth, work anywhere, and not know people that are sick. There's always sick people that need help. But they ain't saved. I told you, Jesus never healed a saved Christian. He healed sinners and told you to do the same thing. You want to win the world? Go get them healed. It will be easy to win them now. The Jesus that healed you is now going to bless you. How? Let me lead you in a prayer of salvation. Let me ask Him to be your Lord. It's not difficult to get people saved. But give them the healing first. And you'll see how quickly they'll get saved. And we need to prepare people in the Bible school to be doing exactly what I'm teaching you. To learn how to release their angels. Are you getting something today? But now listen, go when you teach them faith and you teach them how to activate their angels. Don't miss the second part of faith in James 2.17. What is the second part of faith? James 2.17. Also faith. The word peace is firmly persuaded, firmly convinced. What about this faith message? If it does not have what? Works. works. This is the word Aragon. Deeds and actions of obedience. Can you imagine me getting on a plane, commissioning my angels to protect that plane, and sitting on the edge of my seat shaking in worry? You didn't actually believe nothing about what you commissioned. If you believed it, you would chill out. Read something, get into the Word, go to sleep and enjoy. Why? Because I actually believe my angels are there. So my actions will correspond to my faith. If you actually believe your angels are protecting you, why are you not chilling out? 
If you're under the shadow of the Almighty, if He's your refuge, if He's your fortress, what are you worried about? What are you fearing now? I said it before and I'll say it again. Some people have got out of the fear of COVID-19, which is wonderful. The devil did that to get the church from faith to fear. And they got into another fear, the fear of vaccines. I can't, I'm not going to take one of those vaccines. Uh-uh, not me. Uh-uh, uh no, no, no. I don't want any side effects. What is the matter with you? Don't you think that the anointing in you that could stop COVID-19 could stop any side effect of, of the vaccine? Are you getting a hold of this? If we're not fearing COVID, we're going to fear the vaccine. Uh-uh, don't fear anything. No more fear. Pastor Roland is trying to get me to come with him to, to uh, the Philippines to do some meetings down there and teach this to those people. And I don't mind going, but guess what? We may have to get a vaccine to go down there. And people say, you ain't going to get that vaccine, are you? I'm not getting that vaccine. No, none of my family's going to get that vaccine. Why? I don't want those side effects. You don't think the anointing in you can handle those side effects? Is that it? You need to get saved again. If COVID-19 couldn't pull me down, you think side effects of a vaccine are going to pull me down? If a stroke couldn't pull me down, you think vaccines going to pull me down? If shingles, temperature 107.6 on my deathbed, couldn't pull me down, you think some side effect of a vaccine is going to pull me down? Fear. False evidence appearing real. It's all the roar of a lion. Not the bite. Just the roar. No one ever got hurt with the bark of a dog. A bite of a dog, yes, but not the bark of a dog. Devil got no power. So what he can do is just roar. Give you thoughts to get you in fear. Can't do that no more. Everybody say no more. So faith without corresponding action. Deeds and works to back it up. It is worthless. It is powerless. It doesn't work. I believe, I believe, I believe. Well, I don't see you acting like you believe. I don't see you walking like you believe. I don't even see you smiling like you believe. If you believe, you ought to be jumping up and down. That day we had a celebration at my house, remember? Why were we celebrating? We actually believe. Am I right, Pastor Todd? We believe because we celebrated. If you believe, why aren't you celebrating? The world celebrates the touchdown after it happens. We celebrate the touchdown before it happens. And because we celebrate, it happens. Oh, get a hold of this. Faith has to have corresponding action. Next verse. Verse 18. Someone will say to you then, you say you have faith. I have faith. I have faith. But I have good works of faith. Now you show me your alleged faith apart from any good works, if you can. Did you notice it's called alleged faith? Yeah. Every Sunday. How you doing, brother? How you doing, sister? I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Monday, ain't nothing working for me. You just put on a show in the church. Uh-uh, you ought to live like this all the time. What happens? I got works. My works will show you my faith. I rejoice. I'm happy. I'm always excited. You know why I'm always excited? Because favor follows me everywhere I go. Why does favor follow you? I send my angels out before, beforehand to get me favor. If I'm in a situation I need favor in a situation, I send my angels out and they get me favor. I've been praying for that for my sister, Kathy, and she'll share with you. I sent the angels out to get her favor and you'll see from her testimony how much favor she's getting now. Because we're doing it based on the Word of God. And you can do this. You don't need me. You just need the Word. You can do this. Amen? Amen. Everybody say, Favor, favor. Always, always follows me, follows me. Because, because I send my angels out, my angels out. And, I and I am God's favorite. God's favorite. <laughs> I forgot to tell you, he has... He has seven billion favorites. So. <laughs> but you are his favorite. Next verse. 
Everybody say this. My works shows God my faith. So you better have some works. Or ain't nobody going to see your faith. I got faith. God's going to bless me with a house. I got faith. I got faith. I got faith. God's going to bless me with a new house. Have you ever prayed and sowed the seed for that new house? No, 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 no. Oh, no, I don't believe in sowing seed. I just got faith. Unfortunately, my brothers and sisters, there are places that teach faith, but don't teach works. Don't matter how much faith you got, if you haven't planted the right seed for that house, you ain't getting the house. Because harvest doesn't follow faith. Harvest follows a seed. Harvest doesn't follow bawling and squalling. Harvest follows a seed. Are you getting a hold of this? Now, this is common sense, but sometimes it can't, common sense isn't common anymore. And they don't teach you this. Why did our ministry explode and it's continually exploding? Can I tell you? Can I tell you? I, I'm not bragging on this, but I'm telling you the truth. I'm the biggest sower I know. Nobody in this room has ever sowed as much as I sow. Some people have come close. <laughs> but he didn't have the right principles at the time. But he does now. That's why I'm blessed. Are you getting a hold of this? How did you get on television on 32,000 stations? Oh, that was easy. I was doing a praise thon for Paul Crouch in Los Angeles for TBN. In the middle of a praise thon 230 million people watching me. In the middle of that praise thon God says, You know why you're not on television around the world? I said, Lord, why? He said, You believe for it, you lease your faith for it, but you never sow a seed for it. Do it right now. Right now, Lord, right now. You know He can talk to you when you're preaching. Those of you that are preachers, you know that. You're preaching and God's speaking to you about this and this and you're bringing that out and this out. I called Dr. Paul Crouch, the founder of TBN, to the platform. I said, Dr. Crouch, come to the platform. He's getting nervous now. This is not a recording. This is live television. 250 million people watching me. I said, Dr. Crouch, I heard the word of God. And he said, I got to do this right now. And he's thinking, do what? Do what? <laughs> You're teaching on a praise -thon. I pulled out my checkbook and I said, God told me to write you a $10,000 check. This is not a pledge. This is a check. You can cash this. He got all excited. I said, now take the check. Go sit down. I'm going to finish teaching. So he sat down and I finished teaching. Hmm. Now what happens? He takes me out to a nice, fine steak restaurant in L.A. And it was an expensive one, but it was beautiful steak. So I'm, oh yeah, five-star steak restaurant. So I'm eating in that steak restaurant. And he says, you know what? I'm going to try and help you get on television. I'm going to try and get you on the church channel. Guess what I said? Pastor... I don't want to be on the church channel, Dr. Crouch. And he's looking at me like, are you kidding me? I'm trying to get you on the church channel. No, no, no. I don't want to be on the church channel. I want to be on TBN. He started laughing and saying, son, you don't understand. There's no openings on TBN. There never is any openings on TBN. When people get on TBN, they don't want to get off. It's the biggest, best network in the world. And not only that, I got bad news. We got a big waiting list of the biggest churches and ministries trying to get on TBN. Churches with thousands of people trying to get on TBN. I can't get you on TBN. Here's what I'll do. I'll put your name on the list. Are you ready for what I said? I said, Dr. Crouch, you don't understand. I send my angels out. So I never leave home without the twins. Your angels? I said, no. Goodness and mercy. They follow me all the days of my life. Goodness and mercy is always there. I always get favor everywhere I go. <clears throat> he laughed and said, oh, really? He said, okay, I'll tell you what. Because you're helping us in the praise-a-thon, I can't give you a spot on TBN. But the best I can do for you is I'll put you on top of the list. I said, that's fair enough. I'll take it. Now, I sent my angels out, right? I planted my $10,000 seed. I sent my angels out. Watch this. Ten minutes later. How many minutes? 
Ten minutes later, Paul Jr., the son, comes into the restaurant and says, Dad, have you heard the news? Zola Levitt went to be with the Lord. We got an opening on TBN. Who do you want to put there? I lifted up my hand. I said, I know who's on top of this list. I got there ten minutes ago. Hallelujah. Now, you see, he could not back out of it because I'm right there when he told, said there's a spot. So he said, okay, he got, he got to give me that spot. You know, Jesse, Jesse Duplantis started at 2.30 in the morning and his ministry exploded. God had a better spot for me when I got on TBN. Monday morning, there's Benny Hinn. After Benny Hinn, there's Rod Parsley. After Rod Parsley, there is... Uh, 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 um, uh, um, the, fr- the friend of no uh, um, no 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 in Dallas T.D. Jakes. Jakes and after T.D. Jakes there is the lady preacher Paula White after Paula White me after me a young lady I hope she makes it one day Joyce Myers after Joyce Myers Creflo Dollar God takes a nobody, puts me in the middle of the biggest ministries in the world. So all of their viewers are now watching me. The ministry exploded worldwide. Why? Because I sent my angels to get the harvest on my seed. And what did the angels do? Get me favor with a man by the name of Paul Crouch. And got me a spot that caused the ministry to explode, explode worldwide. I believed for it, had faith for it, and then I added my seed. The works. Are you seeing this, my brothers and sisters? That's why I get favor everywhere that I go. Because I'm the biggest sower that I know. Watch this. Next verse. Uh, you believe, uh, are you willing to be shown proof? You foolish. Are, you don't want God to say this about you. You foolish, unproductive, spiritually deficient fellow. This is not good news. That faith apart from good works is inactive, ineffective, and totally worthless. So, so, uh, this is three times God has told me to say this to you, so I'm going to say it. Pastor Roland, don't teach faith without teaching works. Because their faith will be worthless. Their faith will be ineffective. Does that make sense, Pastor Tom? If you're going to go to 28 countries and teach them on voice-activated system and teach them faith, don't exclude this. Because without it, their faith will not work. Are you seeing this, my brothers and sisters? Now, look at this. He's going to give us proof. Next verse. Here comes the proof. Was not our forefather Abraham? What about Abraham? Uh Shown to be justified. How? By his faith? No. He was justified by his works. What was that? When he brought Isaac where? To the altar of the offering. God said, Abraham, I want to make you the father of nations. Abraham said, go for it, God. I think that's a great idea. I want to be the father of nations. Abraham says, uh, God says, Abraham, I can't make you the father of nations until I know you got faith to be the father of nations. Do you have faith to be the father of nations? Abraham says, yes, I do. I do. I got the faith. Then God said something that shocked Abraham. Are you ready? Show me your faith. Show you my faith? How do I show you my faith? Give me an offering. No problem, God. Ten goats, ten sheep, ten cows. God said, that ain't enough faith to make you the father of nations. That's enough faith for ten goat faith. Hundred goats, a hundred sheep, a hundred cows. That ain't enough uh, faith to get you to be the father of nations. That is hundred goat faith. Frustration sets in. Abraham says, what have I got to give you? So you can see I have the faith to be the father of nations. God says, give me Isaac. No, 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 not Isaac. Took me a hundred years to get Isaac. Not Isaac. Do you really have faith, Abraham? Or you just talk big on Sunday? (laughs) Which one is it? I got faith. Then give me Isaac. Took Isaac to the top of the mountain. The next morning he left, took his son and the servants. Went to the top of that mountain. He told the servants, watch this. He said to the servants, this is faith talking. 
He said, stay at the bottom of the mountain with the donkey. Me and the boy, we're going to go to the top of the mountain. We're going to worship and we are coming back. Knowing he was going to kill his son. Took him to the top of the mountain, tied him up. And by the way, if you think you're getting old, Isaac was 30 years old. Abraham was 130. A 130-year-old man had enough strength to tie up a 30-year-old man. Turn to your neighbor and say, you ain't getting old. (laughs) Tied him up. Took out the knife. Everybody shout, he going to do it. A voice from heaven, which was Jesus himself, says, Abraham, Abraham, wait. Now I know. God don't know your faith till you show your faith. How do you show faith? By sowing the seed that God directs. Abraham would have never in a million years picked Isaac to be the seed. He waited a hundred years for Isaac. But God picked Isaac for the seed. See, in this scenario, Isaac never dies. If Abraham disobeys God, Isaac lives. If Abraham obeys God, takes him to the top of the mountain, guess what? Isaac lives. Because the first thing God gave back to Abraham was Isaac. Now that I've seen your faith, take Isaac back. But because you obeyed me, I will now make you the father of nations. Are you seeing this, my brothers and sisters? Why Isaac? Why couldn't it be any other seed? Are you ready for this? You can't plant tomato seed and get corn. It had to be Isaac. Why? Everybody say, in the loins of Isaac were the nations. That's why it had to be the Isaac seed. And it had to be precious to Abraham so it would be precious to God. Amen? If you do that, you're showing God your faith. By how? Praying and obeying. When you obey God, that's how you please Him. God loves to bless you because he loves your obedience. Amen? We have to be willing and what? Obedient to eat the good of the land. Are you getting something out of this? Come with me to Luke 6.38. We're about to close. God gives seed. He don't give cars. He don't give things. He gives seed. And when you plant the seed that he tells you, he'll give you the harvest he's prepared for you. Can I say that again? When you plant the seed, he tells you. He gives you the harvest he's prepared for you. But the wrong seed can never bring the right harvest. That's why we got to pray and obey. Give, says Jesus. Oh, can you put this in King James, please? Give and it comes back. How? Good measure. The world says, get all you can. Guess what Jesus says? Give. Isn't that different from the world? What happens when I give, Lord? It comes back. How does it come back? Good measure. Press down. Shaken together. Running over shall who? Men. Men. Why? Because your angels go and influence the men that have your car. They go influence the men that are living in your house. They influence the people that own this building. Those angels got me this building because I planted a seed for this building. In the middle of this, Jesus gives a warning. For with the measure you give, It'll be measured back to you. Don't plant the wrong measure of seed and wonder why the right measure of harvest don't come. What does it mean, measure? When we were broke, we would give in one dollar amounts. God blessed it. It was a multiple of ones. In Bible school, we were still broke, but somebody gave me a hundred dollars. And guess what? God told me to sow it that night. Even though that $100 meant a whole lot to me, I sold it. And that night, somebody gave me a check for $360. Somebody shout, next. Why would I get a harvest in hundreds? I had sold in hundreds. About to graduate Bible school, I said, Lord, I need money to start this ministry. A lot of people didn't sow seed to get money to start their ministry. I did. I said, what should I sow? He said, a thousand. I said, Lord, that's all I got. And God said, that's all I want. I'm not trying to take it from you. I'm trying to get something in thousands to you. I obeyed God, planted that seed. 97 days later, watch this, on the night of graduation, the very night I needed it, somebody gave me a check of $16,500. Somebody shout, next! Because I'd been sending my angels out. 
Go influence men to pour into my bosom the harvest of that seed. That's what they did when I got the $360 check. That's what they did when I got the $16,000. Buying this building. Sent out my angels. That's it. I want favor for this building. Many people bid on this building. We're trying to get this building. But I got it. Talk to Barbara, my secretary. She'll tell you, Ted was around when I got this building. Why? I, sent, I planted a seed. God told me to plant a $10,000 seed. I said, Lord, I need it for the down payment. God said, I can do more with $10,000 than you can. Just obey me. Sister Gloria Copeland prayed over that seed for a hundredfold return. I planted that $10,000 seed and I got this building appraised by the Tulsa Tax Department at $1.4 million. We bought it for $360,000. Our first million dollar harvest. Somebody shout next. Yes. Why? I prayed. I obeyed. I planted the Isaac seed. Even though it was very precious to me at that time. I thought I needed it for the down payment. But you know what? God can do much more with it. I obeyed God. And then I sent my angels out to give me favor with the company that owned, Colonial Trust Company that owned this building. They had a mortgage on this building. And it was with that company that I prayed and sent my angels out. And guess what? We got a $1.4 million building for $360,000. Sister Gloria prayed a hundredfold return and I sent my angels out. You know what a hundredfold on 10000 is? One million. How much money did I save on this building? One million. Million. Somebody shout next. Yes. Because I'm going to tonight pray over you the same prayer that Sister Gloria prayed over me. And I'm going to send the angels out for you, just like she sent them out for me. Amen? Go to Galatians 6 6. His Bible says, if you've been blessed with this teaching, it's right to sow. Everybody say, it's right to sow. Galatians 6 7 says, don't you be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that and that only shall he reap. You don't get a harvest because you're praying, you're fasting, or you're living by faith. You get a harvest because you planted the seed that God directed. If you want God to get involved in your harvest, you better let him get involved in your seed.